All right, if you'll please stand and take the Word of God, I want you to go with me to the New Testament, to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, we'll begin reading in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 4. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other, our other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. In verse 19, I want you to take note here. The Bible says, the first thing that Jesus said to them, follow me. Follow me. Father, help us tonight. Very simple passage of scripture, but very powerful passage of scripture. And often, we don't live the simple truth in this passage of Scripture. And that's to our shame. Because you've done everything necessary for us to be able to. So I pray you'd guide us tonight in our thoughts and our hearts. May you speak to us like only you can. May you be thorough with us. May you help. Maybe even there's one here that has never trusted you as their Savior. And tonight they realize they've never followed you because they don't know you. They've never come to you for salvation. And I pray that tonight would be the night for that. And that us as your children, we would, we would find ourselves following you and being your disciples. And being fishers of men. That's against everything that our flesh says. So we need, to, need your help tonight, Lord, to guide our, guide our thoughts once again. Convict us, show us what we need. May we yield to it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When we follow the Lord, then we're making the right choice. Always. Always. I never once followed what the Lord prompted me in my heart by the Holy Spirit to do. Or prompted me from His Word that I should do. And, um, or prompted me from another believer in what I should do. And maybe in the form of rebuke or just encouragement that I was not glad that I did it. Never. But there have been many times that I did not do what His Word said, and I did not do what the Holy Spirit of God prompted in my heart to do, or what I was rebuked by or encouraged by another believer to do, and I regretted it. Because there are some things that you only get one chance at <laughs> that the Lord tells you. It might be a person that he tells you, and specifically here, being fishers of men, it might be a person that he says, talk to, and you knew you should have said something, and you didn't say something, and you'll never see them again. But everything's important. Everything's important as we follow the Lord. I want to show you some truths here, just some simple truths tonight. First of all, following Jesus always starts with Jesus. That's not too complicated, is it? Look at verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Verse 19. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Look at verse 21. And going on from thence, he, talking about Jesus, saw, saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. So both times, Jesus came to them. He was walking, and he went to where they were at, and he spoke to them. It started with Jesus. He gave them the choice to follow them, to follow him. He came to them, he spoke to them, and he said, follow me. 
Then they had a choice to make. Were they going to do that or not? And every day of our lives, Jesus comes to us and gives us a choice to follow him or follow something else. That's what happens every day in our life. I don't mean Jesus comes into your room. We understand that he indwells us. He lives in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he's with us always. And he's trying to speak to us to get our attention to walk with him and be filled with him and have his power and make the right decisions so we have the mind of Christ to make those decisions. And every day he's doing that. Just like he passed by these men and they had to make a decision. He's passing by in our hearts every day and he wants to do something in us and through us. He starts it. You know, we don't go to Jesus and ask him if we can follow him. Right? You don't go to Jesus and say, you know, I really want to follow you, Lord. Can I follow you today? Right? That sounds silly, doesn't it? Sometimes it's the way we think. Well, he doesn't really want me to follow him today. Yes. And the reason why we don't go to him and ask him, can we follow you today? Is because the answer is always yes. He's always wanting us to follow him. There's never a moment in our life as his children that he doesn't. And there's never a moment that he doesn't want lost people to follow him and come to him. All we have to do is make the right choice to follow the Lord. Now, that is a choice of faith. Then we make that choice and we yield to him to follow him. See, Jesus Christ initiates or starts everything in the Christian life. And our responsibility is just to respond to Jesus and make the right decision. When you were lost, he initiated salvation. The right choice whenever he initiated salvation with you and he spoke to you through his word and through the Holy Spirit, and we'll see that in John 16 in just a second, the right choice was to ask Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and to be your Savior. That was the right choice. Then there's other people who have heard the gospel and they've rejected Jesus Christ. as They made the wrong choice. Hopefully they'll have another opportunity. But they made the wrong choice. As, as, as much as I can look back in my life and see, there were seeds planted in my life of the word of God. But I believe the first time I actually heard a clear presentation of the gospel is on January 27th of 2000 when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I don't ever remember rejecting Jesus Christ as my Savior because someone presented him to me and told me what the Bible said. Now, I heard some scriptures and some other things, but no one ever spoke to me and then me remembering or me knowing that the Holy Spirit was also speaking to me and saying, you need... Jesus Christ is your Savior. But when he did, I made the right choice and I trusted him as my personal Savior that night. And he saved me. And I trust that I could say, well, when did he save you? And you could tell me, and you're thinking about it right now, that place where you were at. If you don't remember the time or the date or whatever, you remember the place that you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I trust you can do that tonight. Very important. But once you were saved... And let, let me say this, how do we know that? How do we know the Lord's convicting and how do you know what the Lord's doing right now in people's lives? Um, he tells us, he told his disciples when he was walking with them before he was going to be crucified in John chapter 16 and verse 7. He's trying to explain to them and he's always telling them, he was telling them multiple times, I'm going to, before he ever died on the cross and was buried and rose from there, he was telling them that. He said, look, the Son of Man is going to be crucified. He's going to be buried. He's going to raise the third day. And they knew he was talking about himself because he had already told him that he was the son of man. And so he's telling them here about how he's going to leave. And he tells them here in verse 7 of John chapter 16, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. They didn't want him to go away. And I can't blame them. Walking with God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, they didn't want him to leave their side. And he said, but this is for your best interest. This is best for you if I go away. He said, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him 
unto you. And by the way, personal pronoun, him. The Holy Spirit's a person, and he's masculine. Some people aren't going to like that, but he is. By the way, all the Godhead's masculine. The Holy Spirit's masculine. Jesus Christ was a man. And God the Father is a man. A spirit, but God the Father. Masculine. And when he has come, that's the Holy Spirit. That's who the Comforter is talking about. He will reprove the world. Now, so when Jesus left, when he ascended up in Acts chapter 1, up to heaven, and then the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost following that time, this is what the Holy Spirit has been doing in the world. The Bible says here, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me, Jesus is speaking. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And he was righteous. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And that's the devil. And he said, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. You know what he's doing in everybody's heart today? Talking to them about sin and righteousness and judgment. I think everybody. He's talking to us about our sin and about being righteous and the judgment that's to come. He's talking to a lost world about sin. And he's talking to them about righteousness. And he's talking to them about the judgment that's going to come. And by the way, those are two different judgments for lost and saved. But he's talking to them. So help me out. What do you think we ought to be talking to each other about? Sin and righteousness and judgment. That we don't, we don't need to continue in sin. We need to continue in his righteousness and walking with him. And there is a judgment to come. Don't forget, there's a judgment to come. We're going to answer one day, not for salvation, but we'll answer for what we've done as stewards of God's life that he's given us and, and, and eternal life that he's given us. And so what should we be talking to the lost world about? Sin and righteousness and, and judgment. Does the, does the lost world want to hear that? <laughs> no. No. Did you want to hear that when you got saved? No, I don't think so. I didn't want to hear about my sin. I was in sin. I didn't want to hear about it. I didn't want to hear about righteousness because I figured I probably couldn't live it anyway. I didn't want to hear about judgment. All I want to do is have a good time and do what I was doing and leave me alone. Okay? In my flesh, I still don't want to hear about sin or righteousness and judgment. But hopefully we're not going to live in our flesh and we would receive if we heard something about sin. The Holy Spirit speaking to us. Now that that's what, as a believer now, we're talking about Jesus initiating things. As a believer now... We, we have the Holy Spirit, and we understand the Holy Spirit speaking to us. I didn't understand that when I was lost. But the day I got saved, he spoke to me very clearly that I needed to be saved. Now, today, he'll speak to me very clearly about sin. And when he speaks to you about sin, we need to agree with him. And when, when he speaks to us about righteousness, we need to agree with him. And when he brings to our mind the judgment to come, we need to take heed to that and warning about that. So as a saved person, he initiates things. So when you got saved, you realized, I need to follow the Lord in baptism. I need to be baptized. Jesus was our example. He was baptized. Did he have to be baptized? No, because he didn't get saved, <laughs> right? But he did it to fulfill all righteousness, the Bible says. And he did it as our example. And we are to, we are to be baptized. The right choice is to be baptized after you're saved. And then he gave his disciples what they were to do in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. We would understand that to mean they're going to teach all nations about salvation. About Jesus and what he's done. Then it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Because there's no sense in baptizing anybody if they haven't already believed Christ in what the truth is about his death, burial, and resurrection, about their sin and about their righteousness, about judgment to come, if they haven't believed that, then what's the sense in baptizing someone? There is no sense. If they haven't been baptized by the Holy Spirit because they've trusted Jesus as their Savior, there is no physical baptism that's necessary. 
Then it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I, co I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. So then we're to teach them everything that Jesus taught them. They were to teach their followers and then so on and so forth all the way to us. And we're to do the same thing. And we're to come alongside of other people and help them and help them to walk with the Lord. And so we see here, once somebody's saved, the Bible says the next clear thing that should happen was baptism. And if you haven't been baptized since you've been saved, that's the next thing you need to do. You need to obey the Lord and do that. That's the right choice. What about reading your Bible? That's the right choice is to read the Word of God every day. 2 Timothy 2.15, study show yourself approved. We're to study the Word of God. We're to get in it. We're to speak, speak to God in prayer. We're to, we're to let Him speak to us through His Word. That's the right choice. Again, you'll never regret studying the Word of God. But when you don't, you, you may regret that. What about praying? That's the right choice, to pray anytime and to pray often. That's the right choice to make. Jesus initiates it. He wants us to talk to him. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. I knew you know the end of that verse. Pray without ceasing. Often, all the time, your heart's in the attitude that you can pray. And you're ready to pray. You never know when somebody needs prayer around you. And you should be praying to God and you should be seeking Him throughout the day. I probably prayed with two or three people today I never expected to pray with today. But I saw them and they were going through something. So I said, let's pray about that. And they said, thank you. And we prayed. And I have access to the Father through the Son. And we should pray. That's the right decision. Church attendance is the right choice to be at church every time there's a church service. I have never regretted being at a church service. I was obeying God. There was, there's been a handful of times that I have not been to a church service that I should have probably been to. But I always wonder what I missed when I did not go. What did I miss that the Lord had for me? Now, I want to remind you in Hebrews chapter 10. Now, these are just the basic things I'm telling you about. But the basic things are the things that we find ourselves neglecting if we're not careful. But if we're following the Lord, these are things that we will not neglect. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now, this is in the context of us coming together. So we're to provoke unto love and good works. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? I believe the day Jesus is coming back. Every day is getting closer. And so the closer we get, every day that passes, we shouldn't be thinking let's stay apart more. We should be thinking let's come together more. Let's be together more. And we're coming together because we're considering one another. And we want to provoke each other to love and good works. And, that, and the only way we can do that is to be together. And so, that's the right choice to make. What about being a fisher of men, soul winning? We call it soul winning, being a faithful witness. Uh, I've heard it said being a gospel guide, guiding people to the gospel. So, that's the right choice to tell anybody, anytime, anywhere about the Savior. And Jesus said in this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 4, He said, if you'll follow me, He gave a promise, I'll make you fishers of men. He is going to be the one working in us, again, initiating the fact of being a fisher of men that will come out of following Him. So following Jesus always starts with Jesus. Don't ever think you're pulling something new and bringing it to the Lord. Well, Lord, I know I caught you by surprise, but I got this special thing here that you're initiating. And you didn't initiate anything. The Lord's been working way before you ever thought of whatever it was that you're thinking about uh, doing for the Lord. He's already been thinking and working, and he's been, you're his workmanship, and he's working on you, and he's initiating in your life. And as you say yes to him, that's the right choice. 
and then he can lead you a little further and you can say yes to him and that's the right choice and then a little further and yes to him and that's the right choice and he progressively is working and guiding you one step at a time and he's initiating it what we also see following Jesus means that we have to say no to following something else and that something else will always be wrong no matter if it's good or bad if it's not following Jesus now that's what we find in this passage of scripture in verse 20 the Bible says so the first group uh, Simon Peter here and Andrew he said and they straightway left their nets and followed him okay a fishing net is anything sinful about a fishing net no but they had to leave it they had to leave it if they were going to follow Jesus Look at uh, James and John here, the sons of Zebedee. It says in verse 22, And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Is there anything sinful about a ship? No, I don't guess so, unless it's a gambling ship or, or some kind of really bad ship. Things are going on. But it, just a ship by itself, there's nothing wrong with it. But that's not where they were supposed to be in that ship. So it was wrong for them. What about family? Is anything wrong with family? No, not in and of itself. But they could not stay with their father and also follow Jesus. Now you got to remember that Jesus could only be in one place at one time. Okay, so it's, it's a little bit different for us now. As far as the Holy Spirit living in each one of us. But in order to follow Jesus, they had to say no to the wrong things. That was not following Jesus. So they had to make it, this decision. To follow Jesus or keep doing what they were doing. And that was fishing. Now we are always faced with this decision as well. Sometimes we'll get in a spot in our life and... We just get in a rut and we follow Jesus or we just keep doing that at one time it was as we follow Jesus this is what he had for us to do but maybe Jesus is saying that's not what I have for you anymore and in order to follow me you got to go over here and you can't be over here anymore you know that happens that's what happened to me 10 years ago and I came here was being over in Georgia, being assistant to the pastor, sinful? No. But when the Lord told me to come here, it would have been a sin for me to be over there because I would have said no to God. And I, couldn't have, I would not have been following him if I would have stayed there. And we've got to understand that. If anything limits our surrender... Even if it's fishing, and I like to fish. Say no to it. Say no to it. But you have to be sensitive enough as you're following the Lord and in, in the, in the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in your life, you have to be sensitive enough to realize this is hindering me. You have to be honest enough and let God speak to you and say this is hindering my life. Maybe it's a person in your life that's hindering you from following the Lord. Maybe they have to go. And I'm not saying be mean to them, but, but in order to follow the Lord, you can't, be, you can't be following that person anymore. That can't be part of your life anymore. The Lord's had to do that in my life. It might be a thing. I don't know what it is. But sometimes, well, really all the time, when you follow Jesus, you have to follow him no matter what it is he's telling you you cannot follow and you cannot do in your life. So they made the right choice, but they had to say no to fishing, and they had to say no to their father. What if the Lord calls you to be a missionary? You might have to say bye to your family. You might not get to see them very often. But you better follow Jesus and say bye to your family. Or you can't follow Jesus the way he wants you to. And you're not going to be where he wants you to be at in your life. 
And Jesus, like I said, is not bound to one location today. So we don't have to necessarily leave a physical location to follow Jesus. But he's still speaking to us. He's still today asking us to follow him and to make the right choice in our life. And it means that there are some choices we have to say no to. So if I'm following Jesus, I don't think I can be lying at the same time. If I'm following Jesus, he doesn't want me to be a thief and a, and a, a stealer and a, a killer. Uh, he doesn't want me to be uh, out um, fighting in the streets. And he doesn't want me out smoking and, and drinking and doing drugs. And he doesn't want me out cussing people out. If I'm following Jesus, this is not what he wants for my life. There's some things that as I follow Jesus, he's going to tell me, you don't watch that with your eyes and you don't look at it. There's some things as I follow Jesus that he says, don't listen to those things. There's some people that he's going to tell me, don't let those people influence you. Let me influence you, Jesus is saying. I don't want you influenced by those people in your life. If I'm following Jesus, I cannot be down here at the casino. I'm not going to be down here at the casino if I'm following Jesus. There are some things and some places and some people that you will not be around and doing the things that they're doing if you want to follow Jesus. And sometimes we'll have to make the choice between the good and the best. That's what we should be choosing between, not the bad and the good. Do you know anybody can choose between the bad and the good? A lost person can look at two things and say, this is bad, this is good, what do I want to do? And they can flip a coin and they can get it right part of the time. Okay, but, but being dwelt with the Holy Spirit and having the power of God and following Christ, he gives us discernment to say, good, best. Choose the best. Because the, the good might not be something bad, but the best is God's best for us. If, he's got, if he wants you to be a missionary, the best is not staying here at Grace Baptist Church. The best is for you to go, go to where he's told you to be a missionary at. It wouldn't be bad for you to stay here. It would be good, but good becomes bad whenever the best is what God wants for you. And so you have to be making these choices in your life to choose the best, not just the good. And we have to remember in making choices, it's not what we think is bad or good or best. It's what Jesus thinks is bad or good or best. See, the, see the bad thing about, and I think it's all coming back full circle now, that whole what would Jesus do movement. I think I see people with those wristbands on still. I think it's making a resurgence. Okay, the set, there's nothing wrong with the saying, correct? What would Jesus do? The problem is, is when you don't know the word of God, so you don't know what Jesus would do. So you start making up your own ideas about what Jesus would do. Yeah, he wouldn't stab that person twice. He would do it once. Well, that's, that's not right. That's not correct. Okay, so... You, you know, when you don't know what the Bible says, then how can you answer that question, what would Jesus do? And if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, then how can the Holy Spirit of God give you that discernment and give you the wisdom to know what Jesus would do? Because you cannot have the mind of Christ without the Holy Spirit. I remember when I was uh, 11, 12 years old, I used to have that WWJD bracelet. I'd wear it. Uh, yeah, I want to do what Jesus would do. I wasn't even a believer. I didn't become a believer until I was 19. But I asked myself that question for a little bit. What would Jesus do? I didn't know. I didn't know what the Bible said. What does Jesus say is bad? What does Jesus say is good? What does Jesus say is best? It doesn't matter what anybody else says. It matters what Jesus says. And what he'll direct you if you'll be honest with him. So following Jesus always starts with Jesus. And following Jesus means that we have to say no to following the wrong things in our life. Just like the disciples did here. But following Jesus needs to be also an immediate action. An immediate action. I think this is where we can get it wrong. We have to think about it. We have to let that simmer a little while. <laughs> we have to let the boiling come up before we make the decision. And Jesus is already gone by then. You know what I mean by that. He's already passed by. He's already spoken. 
and you just kept fishing. Well, I don't know. Let me catch a couple more fish. I'm not really sure this is you speaking. Uh, might be just because I didn't get enough sleep last night, you know, out, out fishing, right? I'm not going to put my nets down. Just give me another day. Come back tomorrow, Jesus. Walk back by here again. Well, Jesus is busy. He's, he's going on. He's walking on down. He's calling more disciples. He's asking more people to follow him. I mean, he doesn't have time to make the loop five times because you're not considering the fact that you ought to follow him immediately. Look in verse 20. We see uh, Simon Peter and Andrew, uh, when he said that to them, to, to follow him, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. Straightway means immediately. They, they left it. And as soon as he said that and they heard him, they thought about it and they made the right decision. And they left their nets. When you talk about James and John, the sons of Zebedee, we have there that he called them in verse 22. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. It was immediately. These two sets of men obeyed the Lord the same way. How they do it? Immediately. Immediately they did what the Lord wanted them to do. And they heard his voice. And we can walk with God and we can hear his voice. And we can be directed by him. That still small voice of the Holy Spirit that's inside of you. And can speak to you and guide you. And to delay is to be disobedient. Well... We're going to do some more fishing, Lord. Come back tomorrow. So for a whole day, you're going to be disobedient. For a whole day, I'm going to be disobedient. Just come back tomorrow. Well, we got to help our father finish up what we're doing here before we can get out of the ship and go. Disobedient. They immediately did what the Lord wanted them to do. Does, does Jesus still want people to be his disciple and follow him today? He's still calling people to follow him today. Who does Jesus want to follow him? Everybody. Everybody. He wants everybody to follow him. The Lord wants everybody to be saved. Everybody has to make the decision to follow him because he's the Savior, because they want him to be the Savior of their life. The Bible says here in 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we know salvation is by faith, but coupled with faith is confessing Jesus as our Savior and repentance, turning to him from everything else. Just like if we're going to follow him, we have to turn from the wrong things. Same thing with salvation, it's all by faith. And we just come to him. He wants every man. He's not willing to any should perish. Every man to be saved. And the Lord wants everybody that's saved to serve. Every believer he wants to serve and to live for him. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 in verse 13. Neither let your... Neither yield ye your members as instruments of, of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Righteousness. He wants us to serve Him, live for Him in righteousness. Look at verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. We're to serve God in righteousness. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now. So that was past. He said, but now, now that you know the Lord, now that you're saved, now that you've been buried with him in, in baptism by the Holy Spirit, also a picture of it, water baptism showing that. Now that you've done that, reckon yourself to be dead with him. Now yield yourself as instruments of righteousness. This is how you were living. And he says, but now, even so now, yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. Look down at verse 22. But now, being made free from sin and, be and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. He wants every saved person to serve him in righteousness, to yield to him. 
So who's he calling? Everybody. He's calling the lost people to follow him because he needs to be their savior. He's calling us that know him as our savior to follow him and serve him in righteousness. What does Jesus want us to do? To follow him and to make the best decision immediately. Immediately. That's what he wants us to do. He tells us in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 27. I'm 22, verse 27. 37. I'll get it right. Matthew 22, 37. Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. He said this is the first and great commandment. That's what he wants us to do. And if we love him, we're going to follow him. And if we're going to love him, we're going to obey him. And we're going to obey him immediately. That's what he wants for us to do. And when does Jesus want us to follow him? All the time. All the time. Not just here. We should be following Jesus here to a building, to come together, to meet. But this shouldn't be the only place that we're coming and following him. This should be the place where we come and, and just rest in him and get recharged in him. And then, we, then we're encouraged to go tomorrow to work and go tomorrow out and do whatever we're going to do and live for Jesus and speak for Jesus and follow Jesus tomorrow and then Friday and then Saturday and we're getting beat down by the world but Jesus is strengthening us and then we come back together again on Sunday and we just get a shot in the arm again and we get with other believers and we get encouraged in the word and our faith is increased on Sunday and then Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday we get beat down again in the world and we have victory with Christ and it just happens over and over again and in between those those Wednesdays and Sundays you're meeting with God yourself, and you're following him. And we're being strengthened from faith to faith. We're walking with the Lord. He's starting it. We choose to follow him. We cannot follow him and follow everything else that is calling our name in this world. And it's got to be immediate. When we, when we get into our life that we'll listen to the Lord and do what he wants us to do immediately, that's a good place to be. And then do it again. And then do it again. Follow me, Jesus said. See, following Jesus is an immediate choice that starts with him. And it leads us to say no to following anything or anyone else. Father, help us tonight. We cannot make up our mind enough to follow you. It's not a one-time decision. Although it starts with one decision. We need your help. Help us. Help our faith. Increase our faith tonight. Help our unbelief. You're calling. You're calling now. Follow me. What is it you're telling us to leave? Are we even hearing you when you speak to us? Are we tuned in to what you're telling us? Are we willing to do that immediately? It might mean that you need to rearrange all of our life in order to get us to where you want us to be at. And it could be a scary thing to say, please do that, Lord. But would you please do that? Do what you need to do in our life to bring us to where we need to be at. That we can hear your voice and that we can make the right choice in life and find ourselves doing it immediately and walking you the way you desire. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I encourage you to come, pray, seek the Lord. Some are already at the altar. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm lost. If I die right now, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. And I would be separated from God the Father for all eternity. And you say, that's me, Brother Justin. I'm lost tonight. I need to get this taken care of tonight. The, the Holy Spirit's speaking to me about sin and righteousness and judgment. And I need to take care of that tonight and get my relationship with the Lord straightened out from his, with his help. Anybody like that tonight? I need Jesus Christ to save me.
and I know he died, was buried, and rose from the dead to pay for my sins. Believers, are you saying yes to Jesus when he asks you to follow him? He's doing that right now. He's, he's telling you to make a choice. There's never a neutral ground with the Lord. We're either obeying him or disobeying him. He's asking you to do something. Are you saying no to the wrong choices? Now, it's more than just us making those or thinking about these wrong choices. It's the Lord helping us to make the right choice and to not make that wrong choice. Are you saying yes to Jesus immediately? He'll help you. He'll guide you in this tonight. It's a promise he gave to these men as he was calling them. And I think it extends to every man that he calls. If we'll obey him, he'll take care of us. He'll guide us. Father, seal these things in our hearts tonight. May we just, the best we know how, lay ourselves back down to you once again and say, Lord, we do want to follow you. Take our nets, take our ships, take our family. Take what you need. But help us to follow you. Immediately. As you show us, Lord, we take the next step. Help that burn within us. Revive us, refresh us. Renew our minds that we might be what you desire for us to be. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.